Hello, and welcome to the site of Hyde Abbey, just outside the centre of Winchester, in a place of national historical significance, because this is where, in the year 1110, King Arthur the Great was buried. My name is Edward Fennell, and I belong to a community organisation called Hyde 900. Our role is to explain the purpose of the Abbey historically and culturally, and at the heart of that is the story of Arthur the Great himself. Alfred is a vitally important figure. He saved his kingdom of Wessex from the invading Vikings and had the vision of a united England, a vision which was made real by his grandson, King Athelstan. But beyond that, Alfred supported learning and scholarship. He was a great patron of the church and he also found time to reform the Anglo-Saxon legal system. In short, he provided stability and inspiration against the background of war and uncertainty. And the impact of his achievements can still be felt today. After he died in 899, Alfred's body was installed briefly in what was called the Old Minster in the centre of Winchester, near where the cathedral is today. But quickly he was moved to a new church called New Minster, which was built on the orders of his son, King Edward. And that was where he remained until the year 1110, because following the Norman Conquest, both the Old and New Minsters were knocked down to make way for the immense new cathedral. The result was that the community of monks in New Minster was forced to move. Fortunately, land was found for them here in Hyde, overlooking a tributary of the River Itchen. There was a grand procession from Newminster to Hyde, with the monks carrying their treasures with them. Amongst these treasures were the remains of Alfred, his son Edward, and his wife Aldwitha, to be laid before the Hyde altar, just down the road here. Hyde Abbey flourished as the centre for pilgrimage for over four centuries, and many of its abbots became very important national figures. But in the 1530s, the Abbey, like so many monasteries around this country, was destroyed as part of the forms of Henry VIII. Nonetheless, the spirit of the Abbey can still be felt within these ruins, and I'm delighted to invite local resident Mike Craze to now take you on a tour and tell you the story of Hyde Abbey. Thanks, Edward. And welcome to this 10-minute tour of the Abbey site, in which we'll discover what remains of the Abbey today, and also find out what happened to the site in later years. Not forgetting, of course, the somewhat enduring mystery of what happened to Alfred, Edward and Eelswither. Let's start by looking at a map of the area. As you can see, there were three main sections to the abbey. The inner court to the east, with its vast, imposing church and cloisters, was the monastic centre and spiritual heart of the abbey. The inner sanctum, where the Benedictine brothers lived and worshipped, and where pilgrims came to venerate both its saints and its royal burials. In the southwest corner, we have the outer court, where a guest house provided accommodation for important visitors, and where the abbey mill, bakehouse, kitchens, brewery, and other functional buildings provided for the abbey's everyday needs. In the northwest corner, we have the forecourt. This was the main area most accessible to the public, where the parish church of St. Bartholomew provided daily services for both local worshippers and gathering pilgrims alike. The local cemetery was here too and at the Almoners Hall adjacent to the gatehouse, arms were distributed to the poor and needy. The plan shows the buildings that have been discovered so far. We are just to the north of the 15th century gatehouse here in the forecourt area, and up to our left there would have been an entrance gate leading from the secular world outside into the spiritual world of the abbey inside. Parishioners and pilgrims would have made their way through the gate to St. Bartholomew's to attend a mass maybe, or give thanks for their safe arrival as pilgrims. This shows our stopping points on our tour, so let's cross the road and have a closer look at the church, location 2 on our map. St. Bartholomew's was built at the same time as the Abbey Church, in the first part of the 12th century, but it's been much restored down through the years, leaving really only the south wall as the main part of the church fabric that survives from that time. But it does have a magnificent Norman doorway in the porch, where we can also see a medieval capital, which is now being reused as a stoop for holding holy water. The tower was added to the church in the late 16th century, using stone from the demolished abbey. Recent research, though, was able to confirm that not only had the stone come from the abbey, but so too had the wood. Analysis of the timbers revealed that whilst the tower was built in the spring of 1591, recycled wood from the abbey, dating back to the 13th century, had also been used. Let's go inside, location 3 on the map. Well now we can see the extensive 19th century Victorian remodelling. 
However, there are traces of the original Norman build, such as this sturdy-looking Norman capital and column. And here is an example of reused stone from the abbey, known as label stops. These were originally used at the base of two arches. But far more expressive are the beautifully carved capitals displayed on the window sills that were originally in the abbey's Norman cloister. These finely worked pieces have been described as some of the best examples of Romanesque carving in England. And this is a Springer stone at the start of the arcade above the capitals. Here is an impression of how the Norman cloisters may have looked at the abbey. And finally, up here in the bell tower, we find that reused wood we mentioned, dated 1265 to 1290. Back outside on the north side of the tower, we find more examples of the reused abbey stone. And here on ancient High Church Path, there are a series of 17th century cottages, which were also constructed using stone from the abbey site. Building material was certainly at a premium. Another somewhat weather-worn example of a reused label stop over this door. Now back to the church to find out about a mystery that has at least in part been resolved. For many decades, mystery surrounded this intriguing grave that was marked with just a single cross. The Victorian rector from St. Bart's had purchased some human bones which were then interred in this grave. The inevitable question was whether or not those remains were those of Alfred, Edward or Eelswitha. In 2013-14, the bones were disinterred and found to be from five individuals whose dates ranged from 1230 to 1500 AD and from another individual who dated from around the year 1100 AD, who could well have been one of the first monks to arrive here at Hyde. The bones represent a fascinating link to the medieval abbey, so not from the earlier Anglo-Saxon royal burials. However, a piece of pelvic bone from the 1990s excavation did prove to be Anglo-Saxon in date. The mystery continues, as indeed do we as we make our way down to location four on the map. To cross the little bridge over the mill stream into the monastic precinct of the inner court and through the site of the great west door of the Abbey Church and into what would have been the nave following Alfred's final journey towards the high altar at the East End. Depicted in Tracy Shepherd's fine glass engraving at location six. Here we can see the Hyde Abbey Memorial Garden, which overlies and defines the outline of the Abbey foundations that were revealed during excavations in the 1990s. This was the holiest part of the church, known as the chancel, and the three ledger stones marked the spot in front of the altar where Alfred, Edward and Eelswith were reburied. The enclosed shrubs are symbolic of the pillars that were arranged around the curved or apsidal end of the old Norman church. Pilgrims would have progressed around a walkway or ambulatory, pausing to venerate the holy relics including St. Judoc, St. Grimbold, and rather gruesomely to us today, the head of St. Valentine. And now we pass alongside the area of the South Transept, where the monks were buried. And it was here in 2016 that the Hyde Community Dig discovered for the first time the wall of the South Transept. And we also passed the marker stone that recalls the building of a bridewell or local jail here in 1788, which covered the whole site of the Abbey Church and lasted until 1869, later replaced by the Victorian houses. Turning right into King Alfred Terrace and crossing back over the mill stream via the wooden footbridge at the end, at location seven, we pass from the inner court into the outer court, the working hub of the monastery. The site of the Abbey Mill is to our left, and in front is another wall containing a lot more stone from the abbey. Walking back towards the gatehouse along the footpath, the remains of a building can be seen spanning the stream on the right. Excavations in the 1990s established that this had been a two-roomed house, most probably the abbey guest house, and it was here that a carved limestone head still with the traces of paint on, dating from around 1130, was discovered reused as a building block in one of the guest house walls walk up to the rear of the gatehouse, which, as this 19th century watercolour shows, had previously been used as a cowshed. Now turning left through the modern archway, 
we make our way towards the long stone wall on the opposite side of the road, again constructed of abbey stone. Location 9. Just to the right of the 18th century barn, which forms part of the wall, you can glimpse a small portion of a timber-framed building. This is the remains of the house built by Richard Bethel, who bought the abbey site for £110 from Henry VIII in 1546. Bethel's use of abbey stone is plain to see both in the courtyard and in the building itself. Inside the building, Hyde 900 discovered in 2016 that as well as stone, here too there was potential reuse of abbey timber in the roof space. A major research exercise was carried out to date the wooden beams. Using the dendrochronology method of dating, the number and pattern of tree rings in the wood were analysed to give us a date when the wood was originally felled. This turned out to be between 1266 and 1298. Almost certainly then, it was recycled from the abbey. It also includes many fascinating wooden moulded pieces, which may give a clue to the appearance of some of the other timber used in the abbey. Finally, returning to the gatehouse, we pass this wall that has some fine examples of reused abbey stone. Many of these and other stones have been examined by Ross Lovett, who was until recently the master mason at Winchester Cathedral. He has been able to put this and others into their architectural context, helping us to see how the abbey may have looked, which in turn has helped with the 3D visualization of the abbey. Sadly for us, this once hugely significant abbey, which held land and property for miles around, is no longer here for us to admire. But with the help of the Hyde 900 community digs unearthing new evidence and the study of past archaeological and documentary records, we are gradually getting more of a picture of how the abbey might have been, both in terms of its dimensions and its architectural styles. And do come and see us again. Goodbye. <laughs>